we're moving on. It's a series of endocrine topics. I'm doing endocrine 10 here on my label. And a subtitle could be the endocrine liver. That means we're going to talk about hormones that are produced by the liver or maybe I could hedge a little bit sometimes and say hormones that are tinkered with in the liver, maybe undergo an enzymatic step, getting into the liver and then going out again. But you'll see, you can be the judge. One thing you do need to understand when you study endocrinology, not everybody's perfectly in agreement with what's a hormone, where is it made? Sometimes things are made in different places. Uh, it's a little confusing, but I'm just going to, you know, go with it and make it as simple as I can. I made a little mnemonic word here, TIVA, because I want to talk about four endocrine substances that deal with the liver. Okay, now these are something, these are hormones that the liver has an active role in making. You know, there are other hormones that come from someplace else and tell the liver to do something and we could talk about those sometimes too. Okay, here we go. Let's do the T. T stands for thrombopoietin and often abbreviated TPO. Uh, whenever you see poietin, you can think of making, making something. And in this case, it's thrombocytes. We're going to make thrombocytes. And if you remember from our blood lessons, thrombocytes are also called platelets. So here's a hormone from the liver. We're going to talk about it later, but it helps making platelets. Then we have insulin-like growth factor 1, the acronym IGF-1, very common. And then, of course, in endocrinology, sometimes we have multiple terms. So insulin-like growth factor 1 can also be called somatomedin. C. We're going to be talking about that. Now remember I'm spelling Tiva and there's my V, vitamin D. Someplace a while ago I alluded to the fact that vitamin D was mislabeled. It's really a hormone, but the name has been in use for so long, everybody calls it vitamin D, but it's really a hormone, okay? And then where's my A? Here's my A angiotensin. Here's a little way to digest that word, angio. Whenever you see that, it's a prefix meaning vessel. And this tensin tends to mean you're going to cause tension in a vessel, which means you're going to constrict the diameter. Okay, now we're going to move on and talk about each of those individually. So here we are. We're going to talk about thrombopoietin. I found this neat little article. I don't have the whole thing here, but I did want to just show you the title, Thrombopoietin, the novel hepatic hormone. Whenever you see hepatic, that's an adjective meaning liver. It's from 2002, not that long ago, relatively speaking. And it just talks about the functions of thrombopoietin they actually, and I get a diagram here, but it's going to talk about platelets and megakaryocytes. And you should know that megakaryocytes, mega meaning large, very large cells, that little parts of that cell get pinched off, and those little pinched off parts are called platelets. So, thrombopoietin. So let's get this... <clears throat> diagram down and digest it. Here's a blood vessel. This is the lumen of a blood vessel. These little blue, and maybe I can probably enlarge it here a little bit. The blue, I don't want to get too large here. There we go. The blue little specks in here are platelets. And you can kind of see they're being, they're pinched off from a bigger bigger cell. This is a megakaryocyte. It pinches off part of itself and that makes platelets. Well, lo and behold, after a while, platelets age. They have a certain lifespan. 
the liver, this is the liver, picks this up, this fact that they're becoming non-functional, and it releases thrombopoietin, remember our acronym, TPO. Well, that's released into the blood, TPO is. The blood carries it all over the body, but there's receptor cells, receptors, I should say, not receptor cells, but receptors in the bone marrow for TPO, and this is a stimulus to have stem cells proceed through a series of steps to make megakaryocytes. So that's kind of a nice little diagram. Let's take that away and show you my final diagram here, which this one, man, this one is golden. After I get done talking with it, you should, talking about it, you should like maybe copy some of the things down. I mean, I always suggest that. Okay, let's do this. The most important part of this diagram for us right now is the left circle. Here we've got thrombopoietin. It says it's coming from the liver, but this diagram says, hey, it also may be made by the kidney and spleen. And that gets to the point where some of these hormones can be made in different tissues. Maybe we can say the liver is the most famous, but in some cases, other tissues can make it as well. When the liver senses a need, for platelets, it releases TPO, thrombopoietin. And we follow this arrow. This plus means it's going to stimulate bone marrow to make platelets. That was the megakaryocytes. Once there's enough platelets in the blood, it's going to have a negative feedback on the liver. It really, that's probably should have been maybe this way, but that's okay. The liver is going to sense enough platelets and it's going to decrease how much thrombopoietin is released. If you decrease this, you decrease the circle. Now let me go to this other side just really quickly. The kidney, when it senses low oxygen, like if you climb up and went to Colorado someplace and you get hypoxic, the kidney releases a hormone called erythropoietin, and we'll do this when we do the kidney. Anyway, that stimulates bone marrow to make red blood cells. Then those increased red blood cells can carry more oxygen. You get more oxygen and that tells the kidney to produce less erythropoietin. The kidney makes erythropoietin, but look at they're saying, hey, the liver and spleen are known to do this as well. Maybe not quite as well known. Now we're on to our I word. If you recall it from <laughs> the beginning, I was for insulin-like growth factor one. Here's a nice little diagram. Love these artists. Well, lo and behold, here's the liver, and it makes IGF-1, but it just doesn't do it on its own or mindlessly. It makes IGF-1 when the pituitary gland, and if you recall, maybe we haven't, yeah, we did this earlier, anterior pituitary gland releases growth hormone. Growth hormone goes in the blood. It's got receptors in the liver. The liver says, okay, I'm going to make IGF-1. It doesn't change it into IGF-1. It makes it. And then IGF-1 is released, and it has different target tissues. Here's one. The plus always means it's going to stimulate muscle growth. It's going to stimulate bone growth. Think of all the bones. And then sometimes this thing can feed back, and it's kind of interesting if you get enough IGF-1, and this gets a little complicated, it's a plus here, and the reason it's a plus is because it stimulates somatomedin, which is another word for growth hormone inhibiting hormone, GHIH. So then you get decreased GH. It also inhibits growth hormone releasing hormone, and together that would decrease the GH released from the anterior pituitary. So nice little diagram. You can always pause things, go back. And then one other drawing <clears throat> that shows this, how insulin-like growth factors are released. Okay, here we go. This was from a website where it talked about human growth hormone, but it all is basically it is the same. Uh, somatostatin has a minus because it's the same as growth hormone inhibiting hormone. 
there's growth hormone releasing hormone hey by the way that's an antagonistic pair of hormones right one has the opposite effect of the other my throat is getting dry anyway whatever those two come up to be in the who has the greatest influence in this case we'll say growth hormone is released well growth hormone goes to the liver and the liver and it says other tissues so maybe there's other tissues that make insulin like growth factors and lo and behold insulin like growth factors cause growth of cartilage uh, increases blood glucose and it causes bone and tissue growth we've said all this before I just thought it was another nice little diagram to show you growth hormone goes to the liver then the liver releases insulin like growth factors we'll call it insulin like growth factor one now I want the V word and the V word was vitamin D and vitamin D is very interesting because here's a nice little diagram it looks a little complicated but here's the kicker the synthesis of active vitamin D involves a series of three tissues and a series means one leads to another and then that one leads to another they kind of go through a series like the world series they're played one after the other I think that's a good analogy let's start up here in the upper left of course we got the Sun it has UV UV light it impinges upon the skin of animals humans and other animals you could call this the integument and there's a molecule that's a precursor to vitamin D that gets changed when UV light hits skin but it's not the active vitamin and you can people that love structures look at them I just want to say something happens in the skin now look at that word cholesterol you should know that cholesterol is like the beginning molecule for vitamin D active vitamin D synthesis okay and lo and behold the liver makes cholesterol that's found in the body most of it found in the body is from the liver not really your diet but yes from the diet too so now I'm back up here this molecule goes to the liver how does it get there through the blood circulation the liver has enzymes tons of enzymes and one of the enzymes changes this molecule to this 25 hydroxy vitamin D this is not active yet not biologically active then it comes out of the liver goes in the blood and lo and behold the kidney gets a hold of it and the kidney then changes that molecule to active vitamin D here's 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol it's also called 125 dihydroxy vitamin D2 anyway and then of course you can get vitamin D through the diet or if you drink milk you'll get vitamin D in the milk so a nice little series the series is skin does something with cholesterol then the liver then the kidney in that order one two three the kidney will be sending out the active vitamin D we'll find out that active vitamin D does a number of things it goes to the gut gut means intestine okay let me get rid of that nice nice diagram and bring in another one that's a little more simple but it shows the series so here it is the series Sun impinging upon skin there's a vitamin D precursor is a good word it means something that's going to make something else in a series then that vitamin D precursor goes to the liver this is all going to be in the blood now and the liver tinkers with it with an enzymatic step that comes out of the blood supply and then goes to the kidney now there's another kidney there so it goes to both kidneys it wouldn't just go to one because it's going to go in the blood then you get the active active vitamin D and we, when we do nutrition we'll include vitamin D in nutrition just because that's how a lot of times it's found okay now I'm on angiotensinogen so follow carefully I've, I've got two beautiful diagrams that somebody has drawn someplace in the world so let's do this carefully the liver look at they've even got the gallbladder 
coming around from the back and showing you that it is. If you see a gallbladder, you automatically know that's not a horse liver because, by the way, horses don't have gallbladders. Rats don't have gallbladders. So you should know some animals don't have gallbladders, but most do, cats and dogs for sure. Because if you eat a mouse or a rabbit, you're going to get a lot of fat at one time and you need the bile. Anyway, this shows that this molecule, which we called angiotensinogen, made by the liver, gets put into the blood. Now, this is a big blood vessel, so I like this. They've got a lot of room here. Angiotensinogen is always pouring out, but it's inactive. It doesn't do anything. Okay, that's part of the story. It's floating around. Now, let's go down to the kidney here, because we're going to have to tell you a little bit. The kidney, when, when it senses low blood pressure, releases an enzyme called renin. And renin's gonna monkey with the molecule. So renin is an enz uh, enzyme. This is the substrate for renin, angiotensinogen, and then the product is angiotensin one. Substrate goes to a product when an enzyme works on it. Do you know some textbooks call renin a hormone? That's wrong, mm -mm. it's an enzyme. I'm calling this angiotensinogen really might, might be called a precursor to the hormone. Some books do that. Anyway, we've got angiotensin 1. Well, lo and behold, there's another enzyme. And it's actually found more in the lungs than any place, but I know why they put it here because it's in the diagram. Angiotensin 1 goes to angiotensin 2. That has an effect, <coughs> excuse me, on the adrenal gland this white stuff on top of the kidney. And the adrenal gland is going to release aldosterone. Okay, that's still a lot to digest. Let me get rid of that because then the next figure puts it together a little more and explains it a little better in a text format. Here we go. I'll leave it slanted, it doesn't matter. I can even, uh, let's see, sorry, I can slant it this way, I can slant it that way. I'm just gonna leave it maybe enlarge it just a little bit. Here we go. Okay, this whole system is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Remember how I said, when the kidney senses low blood pressure or low blood volume, here's a word to learn, hypovolemia, low volume of blood. Emia always means blood. Hypo means low or below. And this is volume. Low volume of blood or low blood pressure. Kind of goes hand in hand. The kidney senses it, releases this enzyme. Angiotensinogen doesn't need to be released by the liver then because it's always in the blood. It's always being released by the liver. So as soon as renin is released, this goes this way. Then remember, ACE is in here. This diagram doesn't show it. That's why the other one was included. And angiotensin 1 goes to 2. This is the active molecule. Now, what does angiotensin 2 do? Retention of sodium by the kidney. When it retains sodium, then it's also going to, you know, it's going to retain it in the body. So it's not going to go to the urine, let's put it that way. So sodium is going to retain in the body and then actually water will be. And that's the next one here, water retention by the kidney. Maybe the animal will crave salt. It's going to stimulate drinking. This is a brain uh, target tissue function. Lo and behold, you'll get more blood volume and increased blood pressure that then counteracts the initial condition of low blood pressure. So it's a nice little response. If you have low blood pressure, low blood volume, then these actions here work to increase blood pressure. Thank you.